Welcome to Our Appalachia. My name is Phil Kahn. I'm your host for this series. Today we're going to discuss the beginnings of educational opportunity at the college level, indeed training for teachers in eastern Kentucky, because we're going to deal with the early days of what is now Moorhead State University. Of course, before we get to the point where it was Moorhead State University, we have to talk about other points in time when the institution had different names. We have with us today George T. Young, who is Professor Emeritus of Government and Public Affairs with Moorhead State University. And the reason Professor Young is well qualified for this discussion today is because he has been here with Moorhead State for 50 years as of this spring. I think you told me as of April. The Professor 7th, Young. Thursday morning, April the 7th, 1932. 1932. Was my day of entry here. I see. So at that time, Moorhead State, and by that I mean the institution as a state facility, was only 10 years old. Exactly. I, I understand the legislature in 1922 decided that this should be the site of a state institution for the training of teachers. When they passed the Organic Act that would create one year later an active school to start. Right to be called Moorhead State Normal. Now I should tell the folks that you are a native of Bath County. So yes, if you were yes, born sir. in this general area, you went off to school at Center College and eventually got your master's degree at Columbia University. You had to go all the way to New York City, but not too long after that, you were well entrenched here in Moorhead, Kentucky as a part of the Moorhead State family. I'm trying to still be entrenched here. Right. Well, from what I understand, you're well entrenched and a very revered professor here and a man of the community. Well, I thank you. I thank you, Vice President. Let's back up and talk about the origins of Moorhead State as a facility for training teachers. Now, before the state got involved in 1922, there was already an institution here and I understand that was Moorhead Normal School. What was Moorhead Normal School and how did it originate? Moorhead Normal School originated uh, with the help of private hands in the fall of 1887. And it was uh, nurtured by Mrs. Phoebe Button, whose name is on uh, inside the normal building down here for ladies where married people live today, you know. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Phoebe Button came up on this, in this area, and went into a home that stood on the site of where Bob Bishop's mother lived, which is now the site of the Dorn Student House, and started the, the school with her son, mm -hmm. Frank C. Button, who would later be the first uh, principal of uh, the normal school. Mm -hmm and uh, it operated with uh, the help from CWBM, Christian Women's Board of Missions, based in St. Louis, mm -hmm. which I think still operates as a missionary group, and with the funds from the CWBM, helped by also a Mr. Harges from Louisville and a Mr. Withers from Lexington, so who gave land and money for the beginning of this school. And it was so good that that uh, people were brave enough to come up here and start this school. Moorhead had just come out of the throes of a, of a, a small civil war, you know, mm -hmm. when uh, we had... Uh, big feud. Big, big feuds, that's true. And mm -hmm. people here needed help. Mm -hmm. The school came here dying, too, in its infancy, but it mm -hmm. held on. Mm -hmm. So it was basically a missionary effort it was for a missionary educational opportunity effort in this by area. By the wing of the Christian church. Mm -hmm. What led to the designation of Moorhead State Normal School? In other words, what efforts were underway in the State House to locate a state facility here? Governor Edwin P. Mara, before his term as governor was out, in 1922, had appointed a survey commission to survey the state to see if we needed other normal schools than Western and Eastern. Mm -hmm. They were already and established. At this they time. were already established as normal schools, mm -hmm. but they would become, uh, but they would become universities like uh, we did in 1966. And through that survey, 
there was a need for an additional normal school, mm -hmm. and the need was to put it, to put one in the eastern end of the state and one in the western end of mm -hmm. the state. So, the Speaker of the House of Representatives of our General Assembly in 1922, Jim Thompson, mm -hmm. his name is on Thompson Hall, the first man's hall to be built here, which is now a girl's dorm, selected a group of people to locate the school after the survey had been uh, formed and proved that uh, we needed one or two more of these kinds of schools for training teachers. And several prominent men were appointed by the Speaker of the House. His mm -hmm. widow has just died in Paris not long ago, Matilda James Thompson. She was the wife of Jim Thompson. And Jim Thompson, the Speaker of the House in 22, appointed several people to uh, locate the school, see? Mm -hmm. I don't think Judge Young was on that committee, this but is he was behind the scenes to see that it was located where it is this afternoon. This is State Senator Allie Young. That's right, State Senator uh, Allie Whittington Young. Who's related on, to you, I understand. Yes, he is. My father looked very much like him. Mm -hmm. I had known him since boyhood. The committee was composed of uh, people like uh, Judge Ed O'Rear, mm -hmm. who's uh, second wife still lives in Versailles. Mm -hmm. He was a very fine old fellow. Mm -hmm. He was on the committee, Judge Ed O'Rear of Versailles. He had formerly been Chief Judge of the old Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. And on the committee was the Judge Earl Stamp of Montgomery County. And Sherman Goodpaster, whose son is the president of the Farmers Bank in Owensville, was on that committee. Several others were. Mm -hmm. But Judge Young came in to pull strings to get it located where he was living at the time that this uh, commission was was uh, set up to uh, make a site for this school. Now, he was a native of Fleming County. He was a native there. of Fleming County. Mm -hmm. I think he was born in or near Elizabethville, which is a small place near Flemingsburg in Fleming County. He had uh, moved, though, from there to Flat Creek in Bath County and then practiced law for a while before moving up here in Mount Sterling. That's where he had learned to know Judge O'Rear, uh, who was born in Camargo, mm -hmm. and, and Judge... Uh, Sam, who was a Montgomery County judge. So he was living here at the time, Judge Young was, and uh, was able, with the help primarily of Sherman Goodpastor of Owingsville, who was on the committee to locate the school, mm -hmm. to get the school placed where it is this afternoon. And there was a great deal of competition among towns and counties you around bet, this area. You bet, just like when the uh, burly loose leaf uh, markets were placed here. Mm -hmm. It was around by people in other towns that had loose leaf tobacco warehouses. Did right. I have one here for Moorhead, see? But Senator Young was a very influential legislator. He certainly was. And was able to bring it here. He was almost the sole person to mm -hmm. locate the school here mm -hmm. through the strategy that he used. Well, and he could also be called an early founder. Mm -hmm. But not, of course, like a uh, Mrs. Phoebe Button and her right. son, and right. Mr. Withers or Mr. Hardy. Now, I guess one of the major arguments was that there was already a Moorhead Normal School, That's a right. facility to train teachers that had been this operating area. privately through a wing of the Christian Church since 1887. Mm -hmm. Now, did the state purchase the facilities of Moorhead Normal School, or was it given? It, it or was how a did gradual process. It's still going on, you know. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was purchased from uh, the Withers and the Hargis heirs. Mm -hmm. Buildings as well as ground. Mm -hmm. It's been added to, though, down through the years. Right. And many of the buildings that were purchased that had been used by the old private normal were used for years even after I came here. Mm -hmm. Now, the first name for Moorhead State as a state institution was Moorhead State Normal School. That's merely right. adding the name State to Moorhead Normal School. On September the 23rd, 1923, in the closing days of William Jason Fields' administration. That's when the first classes the began. The classes opened for instruction. Mm -hmm. The buildings, there were no buildings on the campus that are here now. Mm -hmm. At that time, mm -hmm. they used the buildings that had been used by the old normal. And it was called the, the Moorhead State Normal mm -hmm. School. Now, President in Button, was his title president from the time it became a state facility? He had been a principal at one time of the old private normal mm -hmm. and became the first president of the school when okay. it became a state So actually school. the administration did not change. I don't guess the faculty changed significantly in the beginning, did it? Many were, even here when I first came, that mm -hmm. had been on the old Moorhead private normal faculty. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. like Miss Inez Faith Humphrey, right, and many others that can be seen in our museum of Moorhead history on the mm -hmm. third floor of the Doran Student House. What was the nature of study for school teachers at that time? During the normal school era, it was not a four-year curriculum that resulted in a baccalaureate degree, was it? Not in the very beginning, no, sir. They added, uh, they added a year as the years went by after the opening, see. Mm -hmm. I think the first class graduated with a four-year degree in 1927. I they see. Probably, they entered in 23 with a freshman class. Mm -hmm. And they added the sophomore year, I guess, in 24 mm -hmm. and so on down. And about that time, it became... Moorhead State Normal School and Teachers College, didn't it? Yes, sir. It Sometime in the 20s. In the middle 20s. And about 1925, I believe, it became known as the Moorhead State Normal and Teachers College. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And at the time you came then, in 32, I think the name had already been changed to Moorhead State Teachers College. That's right. Dropping the normal school designation. Yes, the normal school was dropped when Breckenridge, which is the offspring of the normal school mm -hmm. was open for teaching in it, you know, back in 1930. Okay, so the University Breckenridge facility, in other words, instruction 1 through 12, is really the main thing that was left of the old normal school you concept. You are exactly right, and okay. that's the reason why I hate, in a way, for history to see the school to see the changes. fade out, yes, right. sir, for I probably taught there long any person has now, in, in its history right. for 35 years. Now, at an early point in time, were there a lot of students here who were taking elementary and secondary subjects as well as people who were trying to get more advanced training? We had teaching? quite a number of people who were students in mm -hmm. Breckenridge. We had to have, in order to make the school a lab school for the prospective teachers mm -hmm. to do their student teaching with, you see. Were there a lot of people in teacher training, though, who were actively involved in the training school program? A lot of student teachers at that time at Breck? Gradually it grew. We had to build the program up. But all the, all the prospective teachers that had lab training for years after Breckenridge was opened had their lab practices just with us mm -hmm. in Breckenridge. And you told me there were times when you'd have 12, 15 student teachers assigned to you at a given point. Mainly in the summertime when mm -hmm. we would have the two five-weeks programs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in the regular semesters, I would have as many as eight and nine. Was Moorhead State Normal School and Moorhead State Normal School and Teachers College, was it pretty much a place where folks came in and lived here and took room and board here? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. People uh, were uh, living here more than they do today. Percentage-wise, it's more of a suitcase campus now than it was then. Well, I hate to say that, but it's true that it mm -hmm. is. Yes, so many of, of my Breck pupils mm -hmm. lived in girls' and boys' dorms on the college. And these were the people campus. in elementary and secondary grades? Some, well, if they were old enough to, and to be permitted to live with us here, yes, they mm -hmm. just slept in eight here for the full week. Now, at that point, were, were individuals coming from outlying counties to Breck? You bet. We had a... Quite a, quite a number of uh, Breck students who uh, came in from Carter mm -hmm. and lived with us, from Elliott, from Fleming, mm -hmm. and from uh, Bath. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. At that time, was there a great deal of camaraderie between faculty and students? Oh, so? yes. Just the other day, a student asked me how to get to a certain person, and I couldn't tell him. And I thought back mm -hmm. how simple it was in the days when I first came. We all knew each other, the faculty. We all knew each other within the faculty and, and within the student body, and mm -hmm. there was an intermixing of faculty with students then. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. What about social activities? Were there quite a social few Social activities were limited. The, uh, the school, you see, had been founded as a church school. Mm -hmm. So we had good social activities, but not as much of it as we have today. So much of the social activity part of... Uh, of the student life here was done on the college level mm -hmm. with county clubs right where they organized if there were quite a, quite a number of counties furnishing pupils to our college mm -hmm. and have uh, oh they'd go to Rodburn Holler or they'd mm -hmm. go to Rope Lake Falls near West Liberty or they would have nice meetings on the campus right. but okay. there wasn't too much mixing when you had those county clubs 
of clubs with other clubs. It was just a kind of a fraternity. Now, by county clubs, you mean the students from, from a specific county gathered together? That's right. Lawrence County activities. had such a nice club. Ryan did, too. Mm -hmm. They were formed by people who had been coming in from around in Lawrence or other counties, you see, where but they you, would have social right. activities. But you think so far as lifestyle and even ethical attitudes, there was a lot of carryover from the church school days into yes. the state school days? Yes, the program was good, but our program today is just as good, but in a different situation. Mm -hmm. That's true. Let me ask you about some of the early presidents and the contributions they made. Of course, what you might call the original president, certainly so far as the state facility goes, was President Button. What he, were some of his He major was the rail spitter. He certainly was. I never taught him to talk to Button. But uh, he was great in that he was the first person to uh, do things that are still the custom today mm -hmm. in some ways, you see, in, in, in some cases. He was the first. Was he greatly concerned about serving the region and having strong ties? Yes, with the he region? was, and he was concerned with the uh, inner heart of the student too, mm -hmm. not so only socially but academically. So he was concerned about the total student. I can see him now academics. puttering around in a building where I still have an office now called Raider, then mm -hmm. called the Ed Building, right, with his celluloid collar on, <laughs> and puttering around trying to do what he could as a retired president. Now, who was the second president, and when did he come? He was in the harness when I first came mm -hmm. to be a teacher in Brick, mm -hmm. Dr. John Howard Payne. He had formerly taught, he had formerly been the principal, I believe, of the Maysville City School, or the Mason County School System. Mm -hmm. Then he'd previous to that probably had been in Richmond to be the head of the lab school over there at Eastern. Mm -hmm. He came from one of those schools directly. I forget which one it was first. He was a, he had a, he had a very dignified bearing. Mm -hmm. He uh, resembled Harding in, in his looks. He was from East Kentucky, though. He, uh, Dr. Payne had relatives in Bourbon County, mm -hmm. but I think he might have been born somewhere around Covington. Mm -hmm. But he was a native Kentucky, mm -hmm. but not born right in the very area. But it had administrative jobs near here in, in uh, Madison County and in uh, Mason prior to coming. You've indicated to me, though, that from the beginning, at least in 1922, it was expected that faculty members either have a master's degree or be working on them. That's degree. true. I could not have continued here as I came only with a A.B. from Center unless I had gone to school six weeks after starting teaching in break. Mm -hmm. To work on your master's uh, on in Columbia. Master's. So at, as a result, though, a lot of the teachers originally came from outside of this area. So many true? did, not only on the Breck faculty, but also on the college faculty. Mm -hmm. I can see them now. I know their names. Right. And a great number had PhDs. Mm -hmm. I would come to have them. Dr. Black, who is now a retired former physics teacher here, later went to Eastern, is still living in retirement over in, over in R Richmond. Mm -hmm. He was a great PhD. After and and the, uh, the husband of... Uh, I forget his name now. M Mrs. Graves I see. had a very fine Ph.D. husband mm -hmm. who taught chemistry here. I see. He died early, but she is still alive. After President Payne, who came to the presidency, and when was that? Well, after uh, President Payne's term re was over, and probably he was a great orator. Mm -hmm. He was almost as good as Dr. Dorn. <laughs> Could make a nice appearance, especially with his speech called Armageddon. Right. Uh huh. Would come uh, Mr. Harvey A. Babb. Mm -hmm. He was our president of the of the school, still to be called Moorhead State Teachers College, from '35 until 1940. Mm -hmm. He was a former superintendent of the Mount Sterling City School System mm -hmm. when he came here in '35. Right. He had some real good points. He mm -hmm. brought people west of the Licking River to us. I see. About the first time in big numbers. He for tried he, to spread out. he had come from Montgomery mm -hmm. County as an administrator over there in the Mount Sterling City School System just before coming here. Mm -hmm. And he, would, he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't fly over Bath. Mm -hmm. Indirectly, he had to bring Bath people here, too, even though they had come in small numbers right. before Dr. Babb came into office. Now, after World War II, the name of the school changed just to Moorhead State College, is that correct? That's right. That and was about 48? About the time that Dr. Baird was coming here mm -hmm. as the fellow who replaced President Vaughn, who had been the president after Dr. Babb, came uh, Dr. William Jesse Baird. 
and he came from which area? Did you say he had Dr. been at Barry College? Dr. Baird uh, had been the head of the Barry School, mm -hmm. which I believe you said was in Rome, Georgia. That's right. Yes, sir. He came directly, I think, from there, but mm -hmm. had formerly been uh, the head of the Berea Academy prior to going to Barry before mm -hmm. coming here. Had such a fine wife, Holly oh, uh, he was, she was educated in the East, Mrs. Baird. Mm -hmm. He has a great nephew today on the Board of Regents mm -hmm. in, in Pike County. Right. Yes, sir. He, he was a kind of a center college type of president. I see. He loved color. Mm -hmm. He put pastel shades in the halls of brick and in the halls of the buildings that existed here. He had a, he had a veneer on him. Mm -hmm. You know that through the name that goes to the music building. Mm -hmm. he, had, he loved music. I can see him now. Oh, uh, he would invite us in groups. Right. to his home in the state reception room to read poetry to us. We'd get in a circle around him, sitting on the floor, and he would read Tip mm -hmm. Sam's from uh, J.C. Cotton O. He, he loved the classics, mm -hmm. and he loved flowers. He would get Mr. Hagen, whose daughter lives over here uh, and is married to uh, Tony Phillips, mm -hmm. to plant bulbs in the... Uh, islands that were in the boulevard mm -hmm. but when the cars came we had to tear up the boulevards mm -hmm. and the tulips went with it right. I know. he also he really that. emphasized the academic quality of this of course he did mm -hmm. yes, do you feel that during president baird's administration a great deal was accomplished in academic his quality? imprint still lives mm -hmm. i feel his imprint and that was a time when the university came to be the university the college began to diversify and to look for other student groups other than teachers, is that correct? Just the beginning of it, yes. Mm -hmm. Take us and, then from and President And then Dr. Baird. Spain, who took the, the uh, office from Baird, from Dr. Baird. Mm -hmm. Dr. Baird was the only president to die while in the harness. I see. In Deaconess Hospital in Cincinnati in 1951. Mm -hmm. Then came Charles Spain, mm -hmm. a native Tennessean who was had previously been the head of the School of Education UK. Right. He came, and he was the first president that I can remember who ever who would bring in national meetings or regional meetings to this campus mm -hmm. of an educational flavor. Mm -hmm. That's right. He was President do, Spain. That was President began Spain. to look for groups throughout so the So he did more than put a half a million dollars underground. I see. With the, with the uh, tearing up of the pavements for a new steam pipe. He mm -hmm. did do that, but mm -hmm. that wasn't the greatest thing mm -hmm. that he did by any means. He brought... Uh, national recognition to the campus mm -hmm. by offering our campus for our national meetings. Mm -hmm. And it was done well, too. And there were good speakers here. Take us from President Spain on to our most recent presidents, and then we'll go back to the early days for another minute or two. All right, sir. To go into Dr. Doran's administration Yes, then. that was after President Spain. Dr. Doran came here in real early 1954. Mm -hmm. And by November of 54, he was inaugurated as our seventh president. I think he'd previously taught at the University of Georgia in Athens mm -hmm. oh, at the spring of 54. Mm -hmm. But he came here that following summer and then was inaugurated in, in the fall. He's a great man. Oh, my. I check on him every once in a while through, mm -hmm. through Mr. Burgess. He's now living in Sarasota owning a condominium down there. But he also ranks those somewhere in Lexington a home where he stays with his wife, but not as many months as in Florida. The university became a university during his administration in 66 and also experienced tremendous growth. You bet. I understand. Physically, tremendous physical growth. Right. Uh-huh. And then our... But not too much at the expense of academic mm -hmm. improvement. Mm -hmm. But he did have an eye on expansion physically. Mm -hmm. Then, of and course, our uh, current president, President Morris Norfleet, became president in that's right 70 he became a president in january of 1977 all right doran had an office here for a while after he mm -hmm. retired and then dr norfleet was inaugurated the following late september of right. 77 right i want to say right now that i want to thank him for the uh, things that he has done for me since he has been in office right that's it. right i certainly do well let's go back to the early days for a few minutes and let me ask you, do you feel that Moorhead State can attribute its growth to being responsive to the region's needs and changing, or do you think that its growth is more in keeping with just the obvious needs in the area? It's always been 
a school where it just reached out. Even when it was a church school, it reached out. The Bible preaches that, you know. The Bible has the verses of reaching out. And this school was based on a lot of biblical principles. Mm -hmm. But the quest for community has grown. Mm -hmm. Oh, my. It has grown. We now have just so many different bureaus and sections that quest for community where mm -hmm. we go to them. They still come to us, but we go to them, too, right. you know, with the program. Right. Of course, it's the, an interchanging thing. The, the, the community is the campus, and then our campus is, is, uh, is a, the community. Mm -hmm. The origins of the school, of course, were as a teacher's training institution. What was one of the major reasons for that? Why did people want to go to school to learn to teach? Well, they had requirements, even though they were, uh, they were not hard to realize. To teach, you had to qualify to teach back in those days. You had to pass an examination to be given by your county superintendent or in Frankfurt, and they had to qualify by going to school. But of course, in areas like business or agriculture or domestic arts, oh. at that time you didn't consider college training as necessary as we have come to. Oh, no. So the diversification of the university has a lot to do with the change in the attitudes of Eastern Kentuckians as to the trends that have brought on new fields. We have kept pace with them by right. having a curriculum that would satisfy right. people. Right. Well, that has to have a great deal to do with our strength and our vitality. I want to thank you, Professor Young. You've been a most interesting guest. We feel that the history of Moorhead State University is very closely entwined with the history and the culture of the Appalachian region. And we have a lot of other things we could discuss, but right now I have to tell our viewers that we are concluding this segment of our Appalachia, and we want to thank Professor Young and ask you to join us again. Sometime. Well, I thank you. Uh, I thank you, sir, All Vice right President uh, Conn, right. and for your tremendous growth in research that you're the head of here on our campus. Thank today. you very much.